hatred has been a powerful force throughout history. Hatred can tear societies apart. It can rip at the fabric of culture. And sadly, hatred is also useful for bringing people together to do things that they might not otherwise do on their own. Historians and psychologists have often asked, what's the role of hatred throughout history? Why do we hate people? What role do emotions play in the grand scheme of historical events? And these are all good questions to ask. But I think sometimes hatred can be used as sort of an excuse for not wanting to dig any deeper and get to some of the reasons why a historical event might have happened that are a little bit further below the surface. With some of these very complicated and long-standing and historical conflicts between groups of people, sometimes it's easy to just say, oh, well, those two groups hate each other, and they always have, and they always will, and that's the end of the story. There's something comforting and easy about being able to explain something away simply due to, in this case, hatred. For example, oh, the Palestinians and the Israelis, well, they hate each other. Protestants and Catholics during the Reformation hated each other. Serbs and Muslims during the Bosnian War hated each other. These are sometimes given as the simple explanations for why these conflicts happened, and then it's like, oh, well, now we can pack up our bags and go home. Problem solved. We figured it out. And while there might be a little bit of truth to this element of hatred existing, and it's certainly playing a factor in people's motivations to do things, I think that the Bosnian War, and in particular the conflict between Serbs and Muslims, provides a good lens through which to look at how hatred can play a role, but there's also plenty of other things under the surface that are motivating people to do things that they otherwise normally wouldn't do. There's very little doubt that the Bosnian-Serb part of this conflict, and particularly the Bosnian-Serb leadership during the conflict, depended a lot on promoting this sort of hatred angle or this us-first-them mentality. They wanted to use propaganda that was going to turn bigotry into rational behavior rather than emotional behavior. In order to do this, you have to create an us-first-them mentality, and in this case, Muslim was the them, and Serb was the us. So for the Serb nationalist propaganda people, they were looking at turning the Muslims into the boogeyman. Strip away any individuality they had, group them all together as one group, and then say that they are weak or inferior or not deserving of the same basic rights that we have. Author Tom Jelton, who was there in Sarajevo during the Bosnian War, talks about the Serb propaganda and how it worked. He says, quote, Serb-controlled Channel S programming revealed the ideological agenda of the Serb nationalist side reduced to its fundamentals. First, anti-Islamic sentiments were induced. Against pictures of mosques, announcers warned that the Bosnian Muslims wanted to establish a fundamentalist Islamic state and intended to make Serb women cover themselves with veils. Having reminded Serbs of their ancient prejudices, the propagandists exploited their fears by labeling Muslim anything that stood in the way of the Serb cause. The Bosnian government and all its supporting institutions were Muslim entities, and Oslo Bajenja became a Muslim newspaper. Channel S newscasters quoted Muslim radio in Sarajevo and reported attacks by the Muslim army. Even after the establishment of a federated Muslim Croat government in 1994, Serb leader Radovan Karavic stubbornly referred to his adversary as the Muslim side. End quote. 
despite the reality that, yes, Muslims were in the majority in Bosnia and they were in majority as far as the ruling party goes, the Bosnian government was made up of all different ethnicities. The Bosnian army consisted of Muslims, Serbs, and Croats, and there was no evidence to suggest that the Bosnian government wanted to form any sort of Islamic state. But the point is, the propaganda that the Serb faction was putting out was not based in reality, it was based in emotion and conflict. Another important element of Serb propaganda was that it depicted the enemy, in this case Muslims, as not only bad and evil, but also as weak and helpless. This is classic propaganda 101 and it's classic nationalism run amok, but you can actually go and look at the Serb newscast from the time, and as the Serb army is pushing Muslims out of their villages and in some cases committing murders and ethnic cleansing, they let newscasters into these villages and showed them the results of what they did. Because in some cases they were proud of what they did and in some cases it seemed like newscasters were using this to show how Serbs were strong and Muslims were weak. One Serb newscast on Channel S had the newscaster talking over images of lines of Muslims being shooed out of their village, basically refugees now with their bags and their belongings in hand and the newscaster said, quote, here we see lines and lines of Muslim fighters and Muslim women running away from old Serbian ground. They tried to steal Serbian land, but they were simply beaten, End quote. To them, this wasn't ethnic cleansing. This was moving people off of land that belonged to the Serbs. Clearly, the propaganda effort by the Bosnian Serb side was sophisticated and functioning at a high level for what propaganda does. And normally you want to look a little bit deeper than this sort of us versus them hatred angle for something more psychological and deeper under the surface, and we will in a second, but there definitely was this element of hatred. And if you don't believe me that it was there, listen to this account from a former journalist at Oslo Bajenia who left the newspaper and ended up writing for one of these Serb nationalist propaganda institutions. He participated in a attack on a Muslim town south of Sarajevo, and here's what he said about the attack. Quote, the air was humid with blood. Somebody started singing, get ready, get ready, Chetniks. Then our people were caught up in mad ecstasy, and the voices became one voice. In such a moment, even the biggest coward or wretched pacifist or cosmopolitan usurer forgets his fear and wants to kill. No one can resist this call from the roots. Afterwards, bandages were put on wounded arms. There was a feeling of sweet emptiness, like after the creation of a work of art. When the fighting is over, one feels that he misses something, this spirit that went out from the body. End quote. Later, this same guy talks about burning a Muslim village. Quote, we found everything as if life had continued until one second before. There were still fires in the ovens and milk was on the stoves. It was as if the village were still alive, but not for long. We burned it. The flames looked like hands linked in a circle, waving over the village to make it disappear. The fire moved from house to house, roof to roof. It was a beautiful fire. Our army was cold and tired, and we just stood there and stared into this blazing village that warmed our souls, End quote. That guy is waxing poetic, calling the annihilation of a village, the burning of a village, the murder of people, the destruction of property and homes, basically ethnic cleansing. He's comparing that to a work of art as something that warms his soul and warms the soul of the Serb people. That's propaganda that is going out there to normal people and it's coloring the way they think about the conflict. And I don't see how stuff like that wouldn't 
ratchet up the hatred and ratchet up the tensions. And when the hatred is ramped up this high and sanctioned by the highest levels of the Bosnian Serb government, dog whistled by the highest leader of the Serbian government, look out for genocide. And 50 years after World War II, here we go again. This was a total war. It wasn't just about land and territory, but specifically for the Serb nationalists, it was about being ethnically clean and making sure that there was no ethnic mixing in Serb territory. Especially in rural Bosnia and East Bosnia, there was a mass displacement of Muslims and even some other ethnic minorities who were essentially kicked out of their homes and told to leave or face the consequences. Muslims who didn't leave their homes that were overrun by the Bosnian Serb army had their civil liberties curtailed. They weren't allowed out of their house at certain times. Mosques were destroyed, literally turned into parking lots in some places. Muslims were rounded up and sent to internment camps and concentration camps, which obviously had deadly consequences. Many Muslims were simply executed on the spot when a Serb paramilitary group or the Bosnian Serb army came into a town. Women were especially vulnerable as they faced the prospect of rape. According to author Tom Jelton, quote, Serb forces had an extra motivation. They wanted to drive the non-Serb population out of the territory they occupied, and an official policy of raping non-Serb women served that aim. A UN team of experts concluded that mass rapes in Bosnia-Herzegovina were carried out as an instrument of ethnic cleansing, end quote. So what could possibly be the motivation to turn friends and neighbors and former countrymen against each other in such horrible fashion? There's the propaganda angle, which we talked about. There's the us first them hatred mentality, which we also talked about. And these things have been speculated by some historians to have a greater effect on rural areas where perhaps there's less education, there might be more economic hardships, and messages like this might be more likely to be well-received. Some have speculated that Religious fervor might have played a role. One Serb Orthodox bishop, after hearing about a bombing of a mosque in Bosnia, said, quote, they were in the wrong place, end quote. Another leader of the Orthodox Church said, quote, God will allow us to achieve the objective we fight for and to divide Bosnia-Herzegovina fairly and for the benefit of all Serbs, end quote. Quotes like this have caused some to say perhaps the Orthodox Church wasn't actively going out and causing too much harm, but they seem to be somewhat egging it on and at least not doing anything to help matters. One motivation that's often given for this destructive behavior is greed. It's crazy to think that in 1992, there could still be this sort of ancient spoils of war attitude where you go and conquer a city or village and you treat yourself to the spoils of war, the money, the property, the belongings of the people that you just conquered. But some in the Serb national camp viewed this through sort of the historical lens of overthrowing the rich Ottoman dominators and finally getting revenge for the historical plight of the Serb people. A Yugoslav historian called this, quote, the old Dinaric tradition that the warrior should enjoy the fruits of his wartime exploits, end quote. Author Tom Jelton, traveling around Bosnia in 1993, offers his perspective. He says, quote, I saw dozens of Serb army trucks hauling away refrigerators, television sets, washing machines, and furniture. In northwest Bosnia, Serb army officers from humble backgrounds could often be seen driving Mercedes and BMWs bearing license plates from a formerly Muslim town. This quote sort of highlights 
One of the interesting things about this war in eastern Bosnia in particular, and that's that for many, many, many people, there was almost no home to go to. Muslims who were kicked out of their homes and became refugees had to scramble from place to place looking for shelter. Sometimes they could find an empty apartment, maybe vacated by a previous Muslim in a different village or some sort of shed to stay in and they had to survive doing that. Oftentimes, Serbs would move into the vacated houses or apartments of the Muslims who were kicked out of these villages and basically just claim these homes as their own. And sometimes even Serbs would fall victim to this, where perhaps the Bosnian army would retake a certain village, or a Muslim paramilitary group would retake a village and kick out the Serbs, and now there's Muslims staying in the Serb home. The reality was that millions and millions of people were displaced during this war. One final motivation I came across as I was doing research that might explain how neighbors and maybe even former friends could do this to each other on a psychological level is to look at this whole situation through the lens of cognitive dissonance. So cognitive dissonance is a psychological term that refers to the psychological and mental anxiety that you feel when your actions don't necessarily match up with your thoughts and your values and your principles. Anyone who's ever done anything wrong probably is aware of that feeling of cognitive dissonance where You look at your actions and what you did, and then you look at your values and what you hold dear, and you realize that those two things are not lined up together. The classic example is probably people who abuse drugs or smoke or drink, where you know smoking is bad for you, but you do it anyway. So you feel that cognitive dissonance in your mind. Cognitive dissonance is when thoughts don't match up with actions when your thoughts and your actions are in conflict with each other. And what a lot of people don't understand about cognitive dissonance is that when these two things are in conflict, what's going to win? Psychology tells us that actions almost always overcome thoughts. In other words, if your thoughts and your actions are at odds with each other, you're going to change your thoughts to be in line with what you're doing rather than changing what you're doing to be in line with your thoughts most of the time. Psychologist Jonathan Haidt, somewhat ironically named for this episode, it's H-A-I-D-T, but he says, quote, When it comes to moral judgments, we think we are scientists discovering the truth, but actually we are lawyers arguing for positions we arrived at by other means, end quote. He's saying that based on his research, We all think we're out here running around and making decisions and then acting based on those decisions, but in reality, it's more like we're all out here running around doing things, and then in our heads, we're actually justifying why we're doing those things. Just like with cognitive dissonance, actions are going to beat thoughts. For the people putting out the Serb propaganda and inciting the flames of nationalism, Cognitive dissonance was on their side. People were seeing these horrible images on the news of Muslims being displaced or even murdered and killed. But rather than changing the action, it's a lot easier to change people's thoughts to be in line with those actions. With a little bit of nationalism, a little bit of a victimology narrative, and with a little bit of propaganda that says, hey, this isn't so bad, all of a sudden you can have people doing horrible things, and really not feeling all that bad about it. Historian Selma Leishisdorf, in her book, Surviving the Bosnian Genocide, The Women of Srebrenica Speak, she cites a historian named Ben Lieberman, who sort of uses this cognitive dissonance angle to sort of describe how friends can suddenly become enemies with this heavy dose of nationalism. She says, quote, Lieberman demonstrates that a neighbor can change into an enemy if his thoughts turn to the long-term history of nationalistic conflict. 
Stories about the close relations between neighbors typically recall scenes of everyday life, of individuals as friends, classmates, and colleagues. But stories about ethnic rivalries show the same people in a hostile light. Lieberman feels that the normal mental framework becomes a crisis framework that is based on myths of violence in the past and the role of the victim, in which neighbors and friends become part of the enemy nation. Furthermore, stories of personal relations fall within the chronology of everyday time. Those of ethnic hatred are part of a much longer time trajectory, in which enemies have fought for centuries. The two stories are bound together in a destructive process in which they become accusations of betrayal and violence in the present. The neighbor or friend is now part of the evil group and must be destroyed. Nationalistic stories can stir the fires of hatred. Once they take root in popular consciousness, they can lead to destroying each other. Lieberman shows how the past and the present melt together. Adversarial images from the past make today's friends and acquaintances seem like threats, thus erasing the personal histories of relationships. The good relations from the recent past now seem incomprehensible. End quote. The hatred might have been there, but there were also other factors, as we just saw, that were also bubbling under the surface and contributing to that hatred. And because there were other factors, that means that potentially they could have been solved. We know that in Sarajevo, at least, people were able to put aside those hatreds for decades. You had a inter-ethnic, inter-religious community where 34% of marriages were inter-ethnic. Tens of thousands of Serb residents refused to leave Sarajevo. They wanted to stay with their Muslim neighbors, with their Croat neighbors. They didn't want to break off and become ethnically partitioned. So to just say that everybody hated each other as the only explanation for the Bosnian War is not accurate, and it ignores a huge body of evidence that suggests there were other factors going on. Sadly, that didn't stop people from doing just that, including high-level people at the U.N., Listen to General Louis McKenzie, the first UN Protection Force commander in Bosnia, talking about the hatred. Quote, if you believe that someday everyone is going to shake hands and make up and everyone's going to live happily ever after, I stopped reading fairy tales when I was five years old. End quote. He was advocating for a ethnically partitioned Bosnia and Sarajevo, and every time people in power or people in the UN said stuff like this, the Serb nationalist side was cheering because that's exactly what they wanted. They wanted the UN and the US and international powers to realize there's too much hatred. The only way to go forward is to do what we want, which is to have separate zones for every ethnicity. The role of the UN and their ability to simultaneously offer aid but also, in some cases, exacerbate the conflict and, in most cases, strictly remain neutral so as not to be able to offer assistance and help to people that need it. That's a story that's coming later, and we'll get there. But you can be assured every time UN officials made statements like the one I just read from General McKenzie, somewhere on the Serb nationalist side, there was cheering. Ultimately, as we've discussed, hatred did play a role, but so did a number of other factors. Famous Bosnian writer Ivo Andrić wrote about both the hatred that existed in Bosnia, but also of forgiveness and connectedness, something that he equated with bridges as a symbol. Bridges are a simple piece of architecture, but they pop up over and over again in the Bosnian story, in the story of the Bosnian War. Bridges are a place where things can be connected to one another and where people can walk across, go back and forth. And when a bridge is destroyed, it hurts because it eliminates the hope of being able to connect with other people. So when Ivo Andrich speaks of the hatred in Bosnia, but he also speaks of this need for bridges and connectedness, he really sums up, in my view, some part of the Bosnian character. 
He says, quote, Of all the things that man raises and builds in this life, nothing in my eyes is better or of greater worth than bridges. They are more important than houses, more sacred because more universal than temples. Thus, all over the world, wherever my thoughts wander or pause, they come upon mute and faithful bridges, as upon the eternal and eternally unfulfilled human desire to tie, to reconcile, and link everything that our spirits, our eyes, or feet suddenly find themselves faced with, so that there shall be no separations, no contradictions, or partings. End quote. 